Good evening. I'm Paul Karakusevich from Karakusevich Carson Architects. We're just going to talk about one project tonight. Um, well, obviously, time is limited. Um, this uh, very dear project to our hearts, we um, started looking at this 15 years ago, almost when we first set up uh, the practice. Um, we had a funny old studio uh, in a mixed-use building uh, opposite the Colville Estate with some very interesting tenants. And one afternoon, I think it was a Friday afternoon, when we'd uh, got fed up of in entering pretty much every international competition, uh, we looked out at the expense of the Colville Estate in front um, and saw acres and acres of wasted space, but also, uh, I think, 12 acres of uh, fairly uh, unloved housing. Um, but being, having been in the studio for quite a long time, we could see this amazing community spirit. Um, so fast forward eight years later, we turn up to an interview um, following a, a shortlisted submission to the London Borough of Hackney, um, where um, we presented our ideas, and at the end of the interview, so oh, you're the crazy guys who came up with all the wasted space ideas in and around the edges of the estate, um, at which point the residents got very excited. Um, because, uh, this, this wasn't a photo from the interview, but um, the, the, um, they, they, um, they'd had three failed uh, master plan attempts previously, um, so relating back to the title of the, of the, uh, the talk. Um, three failed attempts, uh, three master plans, I think 12 years worth of consultation had, had gone previously. Um, we were in the second year of the credit crunch, and uh, we found out after the interview that actually the residents and the TRA, the Tenants and Residents Association, had just stopped um, talking to the council. Uh, they were really, really frustrated, not necessarily with the council, but just with the whole process of regeneration and master planning. Um, so we were very lucky. We won this amazing competition. And um, after the, uh, we got a call a few hours later, as you do, and they said, are you free tonight? We said, yes, we are. Um, and then they said, we're not talking to the, count, uh, to the, to the residents, um, but we'd like you to turn up to a meeting probably half the size of, of this and present uh, your competition entry, but also your approach and how you're going to solve the master plan. Um, so we had about three hours' notice. Um, and rather than doing that, we actually just took lots of cakes, um, some nice sandwiches, and some tea bags and milk. And we all sat down in the room with Hackney Council, uh, who are here tonight, um, and the most amazing group of residents. And by the end of that meeting, everyone was surprisingly talking again, and then started the six-year process of rebuilding the, the estate, which we're about a third of the way through. It's a long, a long old process. Um, so we're starting the, the talk just with some of the most amazing characters we've ever met. Um, and Mike, who's lived on the estate all his life and has just moved into his first uh, new, new home uh, very recently. And he's been uh, on the Tenants and Residents Association for many, many years. Uh, Maggie and her granddaughter, uh, who has been probably the most vocal um, supporter of this current uh, process and has orchestrated hundreds of meetings with every single resident on the estate. Uh, politicians, uh, the Regen team in Hackney, and pretty much everyone else that's been needed to to move the project forward. Uh, Elvis, who's one of the chair chairs of the Tenants and Residents Association, and Hilda, who's a lifelong resident of the estate and uh, still acts as treasurer uh, to the estate committee. So we've we've not worked out a, a better term, but in in Holland they call this bottom up planning, um, and it's it's. And I think in the, in, the, in the example of the Colville, it's actually a, a true collaboration between the residents and Hackney Council and the regeneration team there. Um, we um, started the process, as I say, six and a half years ago. Uh, prior to that, uh, the urban design team had tried to piece together the best bits of the previous plans that had all failed for financial reasons, lack of support from the residents, uh, unviable uh, planning, unviable phasing. And um, Sarah Walsh, the urban design officer at the, at the borough, sort of put together a, a, a little bit of a guide for us, which was incredibly helpful to, 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 to save us tripping up over old, old mistakes. Uh, one of the key things of the previous plans were that they were um, completely unviable, especially going into a credit crunch. I think when we turned up, there was a £35 million deficit to rebuild the estate, even, even with um, you know, a lot of private housing uh, going into the scheme. Um, so some base 
figures here, um, 432 existing homes, uh, most of which are socially rented and still owned by the council. A few have gone over to leasehold, uh, leaseholders. Um, the new framework, flexible framework, rather than master plan, uh, creates nine, up to 925 homes. Um, with approximately 50% affordable housing and 50% market sale. Um, whenever we turn up to the GLA or anywhere else, they will say, how on earth can you create so much affordable housing? Um, and in this instance, we're very lucky. It's, it's sitting at the top of Hoxton Street next to the canal, uh, next to Shoreditch Park. It's probably the most amazing site in, in Hackney for, for regeneration and for reprovision. Um, but hopefully through uh, the, the, the dialogue with the residents and the, and the uh, Regen team, we've created something that has uh, become a viable proposition. Um, in, the, in the early days um, of the master plan, we worked very closely with Eliza's team um, at MUFF uh, to develop an illustrative scheme. Um, part of the process with an outline planning is you have to show a, a, a preferred option. Um, so just a little, bit of, a little bit of context here. We've got the Regents Canal to the north, um, Bridport Place here, which becomes the, the first phase for the decant, uh, Penn Street here, uh, the park, a leisure centre, a school, um, the de Beauvoir Estate here, which is another uh, big piece of Hackney uh, council housing, and then to the north, uh, de Beauvoir, sort of old town, the Victorian town, and the Packington part of Islington, <laughs> the old Victorian estates here of Islington. So surrounded by the most amazing uh, fabric, Hoxton down here, Old Street down here. Um, but interestingly, this, you know, the, the, the old estate was not somewhere you'd want to walk through at night. Um, a lot of the residents had a, quite a big fear of crime. Um, this was our little studio wing here. Uh, so we had a, a sort of a very good experience for the first um, seven years of our practice life of looking at this, this area. Um, so, uh, sorry, um, so the so fairly fairly typical plan of existing buildings. I'm not sure if the um, the GLC architects ever actually turned up, uh, but they pr pretty much severed every single historical link and every single street and placed a set of um, not particularly high quality buildings down um, in uh, you know various configurations. Many with their backs to streets, get dead oops, uh, dead gables to streets. Uh, Penn Street became a, a fairly inhospitable place. Um, Bridport Place as well, the, the building here, the Bridport House originally had all of its backs facing uh, Bridport Place itself, so you'd never want to walk there at night. And the front door, surprisingly, was, was positioned here, uh, and you had to walk through the bin store to get to the front door. So not a great place to live. Um, a little bit of context. Uh, this is taken from the top of the 12-story building, Harwood Court. Uh, given this most amazing uh, panoramic view, uh, but downstairs, slightly less um, successful public realm and, and, and spaces left over after uh, 1950s and 1960s planning. Um, some of the better bits, um, the Regents Canal, obviously, Shoreditch Park, which has been uh, started as sort of a refurbishment program, so it's becoming more successful. Um, and some very nice uh, Victorian grain directly to the north. So our, our brief from Hackney um, after the breaking the ice session uh, with the residents was how can we create a, a viable scheme um, having you know, the, the, two, the three previous attempts uh, fail, um, how can we do it so Hackney can stay in control? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of boroughs um, are very good at drawing a red line around the housing estates and then selling them in the back of the estates gazettes to either housing associations or uh, private developers in some boroughs, um, or just not doing anything with them at all and, and sort of ignoring them and hoping they'll, they'll go away in some, in some way. Um, Hackney were incredibly brave, I think, especially given the, the time, 2008, 2009, to take this uh, £150 million project forward in the middle of a credit crunch. Um, and there had to be some some reality to the scheme. We had to try and cross-subsidize this from the market sale or, or um, shared ownership properties to rebuild uh, approximately 100 million pounds worth of social housing uh, plus infrastructure and everything else. So it was a, quite a big, quite a big ask. Um, so the, the key things were to create, in a way, a new front 
to the to the new neighbourhood. We don't really try and call it an estate anymore because we want it to blend in as much as possible with the rest of, of Hackney and de Beauvoir. Um, we've got this amazing canal to the north, so it's very obvious to bring through north-south streets as, as there were in Victorian times. Um, interestingly, we have one of London's biggest storm sewers running diagonally through here, uh, which is big enough to drive a double-decker bus through, uh, and it runs about 10 metres below that, that line there. And just to help facts, uh, help sorry, the design process, we have another one, a slightly smaller, running through that uh, geometry as well. Um, we always wanted really successful streets and, and warehouses uh, directly to the east. We, we thought this to create a very friendly neighbourhood street running through, connecting east to west would be successful, and then sort of starting to reinterpret the, the uh, Victorian pattern up into the Packington estate up here, and clearly connect the neighbourhood through to the park and, and vice versa. So that was the, the, the big ideas from pretty much from day, day one, fairly obvious. Um, again, existing, just showing how severed all of the buildings were and, and actually walking to your front door became quite a painful process. And what we tried with the new plan was to create a very, very simple uh, hierarchy of, of main streets and frontages, uh, then the neighbourhood street, and then, and then the sort of more pedestrian-friendly streets running north and south. Um, and it was interesting, we turned up to the first design review and got absolutely battered. Um, and um, the, the people on the panel from about 45 feet looking at a, a big model about a double AO, they said, we can't see the heart of the scheme, um, which we thought was quite harsh because they don't actually stood up to look in, inside the model. Um, I think it was probably because we'd, we were a slightly unknown name. And um, they said, we want a big public square in the middle. Uh, which we always thought was slightly inappropriate, given that there's Hoxton Square to the south, numerous squares in de Beauvoir, and um, a bloody big park here. Um, so we, we actually thought the, the, the last thing the scheme needed was a, a heart, because we wanted to try and tie it into the neighbouring uh, community as much as possible. But what we did, did want to create was some very small neighbourhood park, pocket parks and play spaces uh, that we worked with Liza's team on to uh, bring into, into the detailed scheme. Um, so I won't talk to a bunch of urban designers and master planners about design codes, but this, this was one of the probably 350 pages of the design code and um, parameter drawings just showing how the individual plots could be uh, broken up. Um, so Hackney wanted to retain this complete freedom, uh, going back to the earlier conversations, it, it, at the time, it was un, unrealistic to, to find a single partner for the project. Um, so one of the key elements of the brief was how can Hackney develop this by themselves or with a, a variety of um, uh, joint venture partners over the next 15 or, tw or 20 years. So these became sort of in, independent parcels uh, of all uh, com uh, completely mixed tenure and tenure blind. Um, and I'll come to the, 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 um, the sort of phase three, which is, which is slightly special in a second. But the rest of the master plan is, is absolutely tenure blind. Um, no uh, differentiation between social rent, shared ownership, or, or market sale. And again, that was one of the key aspirations of the plan. Um, we, we just did a sort of an audit of all the existing buildings. And, and Really, it was very, very difficult to, to give them um, extend their life um, beyond a, beyond a couple of, a couple of years without spending a huge amount of money on them and, and I think one of the key things with master planning or, or rebuilding um, sort of creating a framework for, for regeneration is how on earth do you keep people uh, for ten or fifteen years in a regeneration scheme uh, before they move into their new properties so um, working out where to start is always incredibly difficult. Um, and I must admit, we we're about a halfway through the scheme, but we're still not quite sure the final pattern of when people will move and into which into which building. It's 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 really quite complex. Um, so, very early massing from the um, from the initial framework studies, but it's essentially proving that um, with a four, five, and six-story uh, density across the 
90, I think 93 percent of the area of the master plan, uh, we could rehouse all of the all of the social tenants and um, the leaseholders in low-rise buildings. That was one of their key things from the residence charter on day one. Um, was we do not want to be living in, in tall buildings or tower blocks. And we certainly don't want to be experimented on. So one of the, the key uh, parts of the scheme was to uh, create as much low and medium rise housing as possible. Some family houses, lots of maisonettes with maisonettes on top, so it's essentially creating a four-story um, frontage. Um, we realized that if we did that across the whole scheme, we'd only get to about 740 homes, which is exactly where the previous uh, bidders and master planners have been, and we'd end up ag uh, again with a sort of a 40, 35 to 40 million pound deficit. So through a, uh, about a six month process, we explained to the residents that in order to get this, where you're living in you know, neighborly uh, garden squares and, and uh, low rise streets, we have to create some value in the scheme. And, and the taller buildings, uh, we've, we've now got a pair of taller buildings uh, sitting where the original 12-story block was. Um, but essentially, those are creating all of the value to pay for the other five hectares of land. Um, so the illustrative master plan showing just how much green space there is, a lot of community gardens, a lot of communal shared space, and then some open public uh, pocket parks as well, and a, a network of streets that are completely public and accessible. And some very early sketches from the master plan uh, that were sort of shown to all the residents and consultation events, this idea of the, the tall buildings from the park. Uh, and very quickly, have I got two, three more minutes? Great. Um, uh, Bridport House was uh, we had to design this in, I think, eight weeks in order to m get a um, tranche of HCA funding um, from the, from, obviously from the HCA. Um, so this was 50-50 uh, funded from the government and 50% uh, from Hackney. Uh, this building created the first uh, decant and demolition phase on the, on the master plan. So this was 41 socially rented properties, a very, very specific brief, which gave us quite a few problems. Um, which was um, eight, um, including eight f uh, family size four bed properties, uh, 13 three beds, and the rest ones and twos. Um, and, but also with the added complexity of this ginormous uh, storm sewer running directly underneath. Um, obviously, with the previous building facing its back to the street, which you all know is not very successful, we created uh, two big front doors. On, on the on the new Bridport Place, and also all of the family maisonettes were on the on the ground level. So there are eight family-sized maisonettes here, all with their own individual front door and their own de defensible um, front garden. And then, uh, probably the most amazing um, terraces here, overlooking the whole of the park and the whole city skyline. And I must admit, we were presenting this to a judging panel. And they said, why on earth have you put all the social housing facing the park? You could have got much more value by putting private there. Um, and they obviously didn't quite get the hackney spirit and the ethos of, of the regen and planning team and also the residents. Um, we luckily still won the award. But, um, so, and then upstairs, very, very simple building, uh, quite a tight budget, £5 million uh, for 41 properties. Uh, would now probably be nearly double that. Um, to solve the problem of the drain, uh, we used cross-laminated timber. Um, but the residents were very clear on day one. They didn't want any lightweight buildings. They didn't want any trespass. They didn't want anything that would fall off after five years. So we, we used the cross-laminated timbers being very light but very strong and then combined that with two very high-quality bricks and, and essentially wrapped the, this cross-laminated timber structure with the two uh, engineering-grade bricks. Um, and there's the cross-laminated frame going up in about eight and a half weeks. And... Oops a bit of detail that's just inside the lift core and there's Mike in his new flat uh, this is taken about a year and a half ago now um, I think he cried on the first the first day which was very special um, so phase phase uh, so that's phase one Bridport house phase two um, is 210 again mainly socially rented properties I think there are 68 private properties in this in this phase um, dealing with again quite a 
a lot of a lot of issues. Branch Place to the north, quite a difficult street. Little uh, actually quite quaint uh, workshops here. Uh, a scheme here we take absolutely no credit for, uh, which is just being built out at the moment. Um, and then the old estate pub. Um, and again, this sort of massive line of services cutting through the site. So it creates some quite complex shapes and uh, things to deal with uh, while we're sort of going through detailed design. So this is now um, a detailed design phase. Um, again, with a huge amount of family housing built in um, and as much uh, play space and amenity space as possible. Um, the residents really liked uh, living in the cross laminated timber, timber building and they also like the bricks. So in, in phase two and three, we're, we're experimenting with uh, a number of other brick types. So we don't want to rebuild the whole neighborhood in the same brick because it'll feel exactly like a bigger state again in, in 30 years' time. So that is a subtle variety of, of um, related brick families and textures and materials that will run through each, each phase. So. This is the, um, the sort of, in a way, the, the, the entrance into the new uh, neighbourhood on Branch Place. Just, up, just um, behind your, sort of off to the left is the Southgate, um, sorry, the Southgate Road and the Rosebury Arms Pub. Um, so this sort of starts to set up a little vista for, the, for Southgate Road and Branch Place running along sort of one, one road back from the canal. And uh, the sort of the beginning it, within here, there's about a, a million and a half pound community centre, um, which will have um, homework rooms, adult education, um, and a great community hall as well for the for the steering group and the residents. Um, and again, a sort of a mix of tenures upstairs. This is a, a socially rented core here, and then behind there's a, a market sale core. So absolutely together, there's no all the social tenants go to the north next to the railway line um, and all the private market sale sits to the south overlooking the city. It's, it's very much a sort of mixed, completely mixed tenure uh, plan, so much so I forget sometimes when we're looking at the drawings which are which. Um, and again, the sort of the, the beginning of, um, you recognize a little tree here interrupting the street. Um, so one of the, the sort of the nice ideas from, from Muff uh, coming through into the detailed design stages of, of the scheme. So this is uh, ready now to go on site. So it's uh, halfway through detailed uh, drawings and we're just waiting for the final legal issues over services and um, leaseholders to be dealt with and then this will go on site very shortly. Um, and phase three, uh, which we've done in collaboration with Dave, David Chipfield Architects. Um, Two taller buildings within the master plan. We had um, permission to go to 20 stories and 16 stories within a, within a series of parameter envelopes, and uh, we've been over the last probably 12 months working through that. So this is now in planning, uh, and will hopefully come through planning in the summer, and then go on to detailed design. Um, so quite an awkward site, and I must admit, when we were doing the master plan, um, it's pretty much the only shape we didn't test. Um, but during the competition, um, some of the residents in Bridport House said, what's going to happen if you put a 35-metre flank of building here? And they knew, they knew from, the, from the master plan and the outline stages that there had to be a tall building there. Um, and one of the residents took a photo at 5.30 in the morning from the balcony here and the sun sort of rising over here. And we, thought, and we wondered well, actually whether if we started cutting the, the corners actually whether that would uh, minimise the, the loss of light to all of the, in a way, the existing residents, the Bridport, but then obviously the new residents moving into the surrounding buildings. And it actually did. It worked quite well in, in actually maximising the amount of light, but also when you're close up to these buildings, which are obviously the future residents will be, um, you're, you're sort of looking at more elegant profiles rather than a 35-metre wide uh, slab block of, of market sale accommodation. So... We, we look to create uh, two buildings that function in the round um, and create this sort of gateway, uh, this isn't a bad word, but an entrance into the neighbourhood and, and vice versa, an entrance into the park, um, maximise the light into all the surrounding properties. Um, and also a slight byproduct of the hexagonal form was that uh, we have 100% dual aspect units um, because each, uh, I'll just that one, um, each each um, each unit is is sort of wrapped around a corner, 
so you get the most amazing views in regardless of which uh, facet of the building or face of the building you're living on um, you've always got amazing light and amazing view so some little sketches uh, working through um, the, the, the detailed um, landscape for this section is uh, with Vocht uh, landscape architects um, and we sort of created a little hump between the park and the neighbourhood street um, and then a little cafe, community cafe downstairs in, within two, um, two buildings with 200 market sale flats with a, with a really beautiful little community cafe downstairs um, and then also the two entrance foyers that, that rise up through the main building. And for this one, we're, we're um, obviously most high-rise buildings nowadays are, are, are clad in glass or something very lightweight, and uh, we wanted to avoid that. Um, we, d we did investigate the, the option of a pigmented concrete, um, but we actually thought the brick was a, was a more interesting and more appropriate material for the Colville. And um, we've looked at a, a cast uh, where the brick is actually cast into a, a solid concrete backing, and it rises... Uh, from from the ground into these vaults that create the lobbies and the cafe, and then up through the the whole building. Thank you very much. Thank you.